ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ನಮಸ್ತೆ So today I want to talk about the yoga of death. There is a certain yoga process which if performed at the time of death leads to a higher destination in the next life. And what is this yoga process? Huh? This such a special yoga? Well, guess what? It's the same yoga process that's given by Patanjali and other writers. that is the ashtanga yoga the eight steps or eight limbs of yoga and these are very well known but i'm going to go over them anyway <laughs> first is yama what to do niyama what not to do then asana the sitting posture pranayama balance of the life airs then there's pratyahara withdrawal of the attention from the senses this is one that's very hard for most people but this is the actual beginning of yoga everything else is just preliminary and then there's concentration dharana then dhyana which is the actual meditation when the mind becomes one pointed and that leads to the goal which is samadhi when the body dies these eight steps happen automatically try to understand these eight steps are going to happen to you at the time of death so the whole purpose of practicing yoga is to prepare for this and i don't mean just you know the exercise class down at the local gym that they call yoga but actually has nothing to do with real yoga first of all let's look at yama niyama yama niyama means leading a pious life and it begins with accepting a guru the first instruction of yama is to take a guru and live a pure life no intoxication or meat eating or gambling or illicit sex try to become a renunciant that's niyama don't do unnecessary things so the funny thing is at the time of death when the body is falling apart the mind is falling apart one becomes incapable of sinful activity by force isn't it unless one is so very unfortunate as to die from an overdose or something like that which is in the mode of ignorance so we don't need to think about those people we're thinking about the people who are in goodness who are intelligent who want to prepare for death while they're still young and strong so this is the right attitude so we're going to emphasize these people not the stupid people that blow it okay So then if we are sincere and we really want to solve the problem of death we'll take a guru we'll follow the rules and regulations of the scriptures we'll perform the pujas the worship huh we'll learn from the scriptures about the different gods and how to worship them and we'll do that worship and we'll get the results and that means we have a stable comfortable life without any disturbance or anxiety so then the next thing is sitting posture asana well what happens when the body gets old huh? <laughs> you can't do anything but sit still now the whole point of asana is to uh make the body still so that we can forget about it We need a stable sitting posture so that we can get the body and the senses out of our mind out of our attention 
and just focus on consciousness within. If the attention is attached to the senses, if we're moving here and there and we're doing this and that, it's hard to focus the mind on one point. So then there's pranayama. The ultimate goal of pranayama is not to, as my Adi guru used to put it, breathe like a bellows. <laughs> we see people practicing the so-called breath of fire and so on. This is not pranayama. Pranayama is more like the Buddha's teaching, anapanasati, where the breath becomes slower and more and more subtle until it practically stops on its own. You watch someone who's sleeping, the way they breathe, unless they're having a nightmare or something, <laughs> the breath is very shallow and very smooth and silent. Almost, there's, a, there's an old test where you take a piece of cotton, uh, like a cotton ball, and you put it in front of someone's nose or mouth. And you can see the fibers of the cotton moving just a little bit. That's how the breath should be in samadhi, in yoga. And then what's the next one? Pratyahara. Pratyahara means to withdraw the attention from the senses. This happens automatically at the time of death. In fact, it's, it's forced on us. So if the time of death arrives and we have no experience with it, maybe it causes us to panic. Oh, I can't see, I can't hear, I can't feel my body. So by practice of yoga, by proper practice of yoga, not the nonsense exercise business, but real yoga, one becomes accustomed to withdrawing the attention from the senses. One becomes used to forgetting about the body, forgetting about the mind, huh? ignoring the thoughts that come up in the mind. And by the way, a very important help for this is chanting of a mantra. Mantra can help the mind become centered on one point, which is not in the body or in the thoughts based on I. Because after all, the mantra is about the god or goddess that one worships. I chant the Mahasodashi mantra, on which we have a whole series, <laughs> which you're invited to watch. This is the most powerful mantra I've ever found. It has completely solved all my material problems. <laughs> it's so powerful, it's so wonderful. And especially when chanted in a place like Arunachala, Tiruvannamalai, which is the most holy place on the planet in my experience, and I've been all over. This mantra can really, I'm telling you, it really solve all your problems, inner and outer, so check it out. So this leads, this dharna leads to concentration of the mind on one point. Now that point cannot be on the body or in the mind because both of those are unstable. How can you concentrate on one point if the point is always changing? Uh, so the body and especially the mind are always changing, constantly unstable. The only stable point to concentrate on is consciousness, because consciousness is always there, and it's always the same. And I don't mean consciousness of the senses or consciousness of the mind. I mean pure consciousness, which is conscious only of itself. This is better termed awareness. And the awareness of awareness is the uh, prime point to concentrate on for meditation. So that's dharana. Once that concentration is achieved, then you're in dhyana, meditation. And meditation really means that the thoughts become completely quiet, completely silent. Now this is gonna happen at the time of death. 
because there's nothing else. Huh? Everything else, the, the body, the senses, even the mind, falls silent. The breath stops. A few seconds later, the mind stops. Even if you're hearing the inner sounds, you know, sometimes called tinnitus, but they, they treat it like a disease. It's not a disease. <laughs> it's the hissing of the snake of Kundalini. And when that hissing stops, it means that the life energy is about to depart from the body. That's death. So when this happens, then there's no more senses, no more breath, no more mind. One loses touch with the body completely. Thoughts automatically become zero. So one should practice this deliberately before the time of death then you're not freaked out when it actually happens or when it's forced to happen by withdrawal of the consciousness from the body. And then finally, this meditation, this dhyana, leads to samadhi. Huh? In samadhi, <laughs> it's so wonderful. There is this unlimited <laughs> blissful pleasure uh, I can't help myself when I even think about it. <laughs> I get always blissful. The pleasure is due to awareness of awareness, being the all in all. This is Brahman. This is God. This is the root source of everything. Huh? Everything that we experience happens in awareness. Try to understand happens in Brahman. There is really no world. There is really no body. There is really no senses and mind. These are all appearances in consciousness, which is simply just awareness with an object. So when this awareness becomes turned back on itself, when the mirror of the mind, instead of reflecting the senses and the outer world, turns and reflects the consciousness, the pure awareness that is the source. That is samadhi. And when that is maintained, then there is no need to accept another body. There is no need to come back into this world of birth and death and suffering. Because everything about this world is suffering. The Buddha states it very nicely. He says, Thoughts are changing. Consciousness is always changing. Perceptions are changing. Names and forms are always changing. Sensations are changing. Feelings are changing. The body is always changing. So, is something that changes and which is unstable a source of happiness? And the monks reply, no. He says, actually, it's just a source of suffering. Why? Because it always changes. Just as you're getting used to one way the world is, it changes and becomes something else. And this goes on indefinitely. Huh? So this world, from consciousness on down, to the rocks and stones <laughs> is nothing but suffering. And when we have an opportunity at the time of death to transcend this suffering, then if we can reach samadhi and hold it at the time of leaving the body, then we're never going to be born again because we have reached Brahman, the source. Now, if that's not possible, at least we can hold on to a mantra and visualize a form of God and go to the realm, go to the planet or the world of that God or goddess. And there, continue our sadhana. And we're going to talk about that technique next time. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.